Hello world. David with Miracle Canine Training here. We posted this morning impulsively we were gonna do a Q&A. We have done a lot of videos in the last uh, two weeks here and we wanted to change it up a little bit. We used to do a lot of these. We stopped doing them for a little bit for who knows what reason. So we're gonna try to do it again. We have a lot of questions here. I'm gonna get through as many as I can. I am not in much of a time crunch, so this might be a long one. So let's jump into it. First question from Buster and Kobe. I live in a seven floor apartment and have trained my one dog to pee on a pad because by the time I get my jacket and shoes on and wait for the elevator, he would end up peeing in the hall. But in a few months, we will be moving into our first new home. How do I break a pad habit I created? By the way, can't wait to start sessions this month with you. Hit end. Really? There you go. All right, sorry guys. Quick uh, quick phone ring there that we gotta put on silent here. That's probably a bad move to have the one in here. No, we're not restarting. We're rolling right now. All right, anyways, Buster and Kobe, starting lessons. I remember talking to you guys, getting you guys all situated. They're gonna be starting one-on-ones. Uh, we're board and train one of the two here soon. Anyways, pee pad problems. This is um, a common thing that we'll see in apartment buildings. This is a common thing we'll see with puppies, and this is a common thing we'll see with small dogs. Pee pads in general, one of the worst things that you can get your dog. We do not like them at all. We do not recommend them typically. Um, and that is for a couple of reasons. The first and foremost one is just you are teaching the dog to go to the bathroom in the house, which is never something that we want. Um, anytime that people use pee pads, there's a good chance it's due to some degree of laziness initially, right? Ultimately, we are either having issues with the potty training in the house due to us not taking the dog out frequently enough. We are not home enough to be able to, um, you know, get the dog out regularly. Uh, we're not able to crate train the dog for whatever reason, so we're leaving the dog out. We're hoping the pee pads are a good target for the dog to go into, but no matter what way you spin it, the issue is the dog is rehearsing going to the bathroom in the home and then, um, you know, we are not letting the dog out frequently enough. So what you gotta do is you essentially gotta start from scratch. I'm not sure how old um, the dogs are here in this case, but you need to treat this dog as if it were an eight week old puppy uh, as soon as you bring the dog into the house. So a couple things here. First and foremost, is your dog crate trained? If not, get the dog in a kennel. The dog needs to be in a kennel anytime they're not in eyesight right now. Um, because anytime the dog is not in eyesight, you're gonna be having issues with the dog rushing to go to the bathroom, right? So when you need to get the dog to go outside, when you, it looks like, uh, looks like when you wake up in the morning or, or when you're getting ready to let the dog out, before you do anything, before you go to grab your coat, put your shoes on, this and that, put the dog on a leash, right? First thing you do before you do anything else, before you grab your keys, before you walk to the door. What this is gonna do is this is gonna block the dog's ability of being able to run down the hall and go to the spot they're typically used to rehearsing it in um, and, and all this kind of stuff. And it's gonna keep the dog at your side and it's gonna keep the dog in a little bit calmer of a state of mind. They're not gonna be zipping around all amped up and losing control of their bladder and stuff like that. Walk the dog outside as soon as you got the leash on, uh, put your coat on, put all your things on, take the dog outside, get the dog to go to the bathroom. If the dog does not go to the bathroom within a couple minutes of being outside, walk in, still with the dog on the leash, put the dog into a crate, leave the dog in the crate for about 10, 15 minutes, and then try again, right? And essentially what you're doing is you're teaching the dog they're earning their freedom by going to the bathroom outside. We are using the crate because the crate is nine times out of 10, a place that the dog will never go to the bathroom uh, inside uh, if you've done a good job with the crate training portion of things. Um, and then, like I said, after those 10 to 15 minutes, take the dog back out, confirm that they go. The second that they go, you can have the dog inside the house again. In addition to that specific issue that you're having problems in, which is um, the dog rehearsing Rehearsing, obviously when you're getting your coat on and stuff like that, going into the hall and going to the bathroom, you have to make sure for the next seven days, start with seven days, can I make sure this dog does not get out of eyesight and have a, an, uh, a bathroom issue in the house? If you're noticing other predictable patterns like you did right here, take note of those and troubleshoot them in your head of how can I make sure the dog doesn't have accidents in this? Whether it's a room, if you need to keep the door closed, whether it is when you're taking a shower and you don't have your eyes on the dog and the dog is going somewhere else, in that case, stick the dog um, in a crate while you're taking a shower. Um, and just start managing your day and breaking it down as if it were a puppy or like an infant, right? You would never leave an infant unattended. Anytime the dog is, or the infant or the dog is unattended, you would have them in a crib, obviously, or you would have the dog in a crate, right? So you have to look at things that way. 
um, completely eliminate the pee pads. If you haven't already, you have to completely ditch them and throw them away, right? That's obviously a target for the dog, but just because you're removing it doesn't mean that um, the dog's gonna stop going, you know, looking for it and going to the bathroom in the house, but it's gonna get you a head start if we're changing things, right? Things are moving, things are changing, it's different right now. My routine is different, my structure is different, and you gotta tackle it gung-ho like that. Um, if the dog's a little bit older, it might be a little bit of a pain in the ass initially because you gotta work through a lot of kind of ingrained habits that the dog has, but like I said, treat it like an eight-week-old puppy, absolutely no unsupervised time or out of sight time. Uh, if you need to leave a leash on the dog in the house in order to block that, you can. Um, and then put the leash on the dog and hold that leash before you're gonna put any of those things on so the dog can't rehearse going to the bathroom there. Uh, and then obviously the method of the dog doesn't go to the bathroom outside right away, stick them in the crate for 10 to 15 minutes and try again and make them earn that freedom out. Hope that helps. Long-winded question there. All right, let's move on to question two. Best tips or steps for socializing a dog that has dog aggression, resource guarding issues with other dogs? This is a loaded question, and this is a question I get asked all the time in regards to how do I socialize my dog who may be having issues with other dogs. And there's a couple of different answers for this, and there's a couple of different layers to this, right? First and foremost, if your dog is truly aggressive towards other dogs and like really trying to do serious harm against other dogs, you're likely gonna need professional help with it, right? It is really, really challenging for people to totally get over those issues if they're deep-rooted dog aggression issues. So confirm, are you just having squabbles, right? Is the dog just insecure around the other dogs and stuff like that? Or do you really have a dog that is dog aggressive, right? So um, one big mistake that I see people make going into any sort of socialization related issues, whether it's dog or people, is they ask the question first of how do I socialize my dog with these triggers, as opposed to first, how do I gain the control and the communication around these triggers so I can then begin to socialize them, right? Because if you're just throwing them willy-nilly into socialization situations, but you don't have communication established, you're setting yourself up for failure and you're absolutely going to have problems, right? If I can't tell my no, or if I can't tell my dog no and feel really confident they're going to understand that or give my dog a command and know that it's very reliable in high arousal situations, then when something happens, not if something happens, I'm not going to be in a position to address it. Because that's the big thing on getting over these socialization related issues is you have to be able to consistently provide consequences for the unwanted behaviors that you're looking for, right? So first and foremost, confirm if the dog is truly dog aggressive or if you're just having some socialization related issues. If it's just socialization related issues, then you're gonna move through these steps. First and foremost, gain control over the dog. I typically only recommend doing remote collar training for stuff like this. The e-collar gives you the ability to communicate with your dog from a distance without needing to be physically attached to them. We know the leash creates problems when it comes to socialization. So you have to be able to have the dog off leash in these situations and know you can still communicate with them, right? So first and foremost, e-collar training, it could just be basic training. You could do your walk and like your recall, which we have DIY videos on YouTube of how to do those things. Pick up an e-collar, a high quality one, preferably mini educator or something from maybe dog chart or something. Train the dog on the recall, train the dog in the leash walking. All of those steps are on YouTube. Once we have those things taught, <clears throat> we know we have some degree of communication established. We know the dog understands the remote collar so we can start using it for corrective based things. And we also know um, that we have some basis of communication established. We know the dog knows what the word no is, right? Second thing that you're gonna need here in order to do this, a muzzle, right? I only recommend Baskerville muzzles. Even if your dog isn't that bad around other dogs, but you're still having some issues with them, I would recommend getting them fitted up with a muzzle. And the first couple times you go to do this on your own or with a friend, utilizing a Baskerville muzzle for safety purposes. And also because if your dog's on a muzzle, you as well as the other person is gonna feel a hell of a lot more confident um, that, you know, and comfortable that there's not gonna be an issue. And really what's the worst that happens at that point if they have a muzzle on, right? So e-collar on, muzzle on. Next starts the actual socialization process. You had mentioned in this that um, the dog has some resource guarding issues towards other dogs, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to eliminate completely the three big things that we see dogs fight over. Food, toys, affection, right? Those three things are the number one triggers that dogs are gonna fight over if they're gonna fight over them. So 
absolutely no treats, absolutely no food, even remotely in the area right now. Absolutely no toys or, you know, uh, bones or anything like that in the area. Put them away, put them in another room or if you're doing it outside, just make sure they're not out there or anything. And then absolutely no affection from the human's part. That includes giving the googly eyes. That includes, oh, your puppy is so cute and trying to talk to them and this and that. Pay no mind to the dogs. Your only job and the other person's only job in those social situations is playing lifeguard and making sure everybody's safe and comfortable, right? It's like if you went to a kid's birthday party and you're trying to intervene yourself into the mix while they're playing and doing their thing and stuff like that. You're just gonna, you're just gonna create frustration. It's gonna make things awkward and you're not gonna provide a healthy social experience for those children or in this case, those dogs. So eliminate those things those three things completely. So that is setting the, the grounds for your socialization. Next, you gotta pick an area to do this in. I typically recommend either in uh, outdoor, uh, semi-fenced in, enclosed area, right? Or a large room in a house that's not gonna have a whole lot of nooks and crannies for the dogs to get themselves all wound up in and tangled up and backed against corners and stuff like that. Have your muzzle on, have your e-collar on. Um, have the dog drag a leash if, the dog, if you're worried that the dog is gonna go after the other dog. Preemptively set your e-collar all the way up. Not low, not 50 out of 100, not 70 out of 100, set it at 100. And that is not with the expectation that you're gonna to need to use it. That is with the expectation that you have it as a safety protocol where if your dog were to go after another dog, there's a very good chance that you're gonna be able to get their attention off of that dog just with the tap of that button. Then what you gotta do is you gotta walk both dogs into the room, drop your leashes, let them start socializing. Just watch, don't say anything, don't do anything, don't grab the leashes, don't hover really close and stuff like that. Just supervise it, watch it, don't worry about a little growl here or there or something like that if the dog has a muzzle on in this case. The only time you are going to do absolutely anything is if your dog full on tries to go after the other dog, and if that's the case, what you're gonna do is you're gonna say no, and you're gonna tap your button three times on the e-collar. Again, that's set all the way up. What will probably happen then is your dog might go, run into the corner, hang out in the corner for the rest of the time. That's fine. The first goal here is coexistence. After repeated sessions of doing this with different types of dog and dogs, and as your dog does well, and you do not need to correct for any sort of nonsense in those situations, you would start fading the muzzle out at that point. And that's when you're gonna see your dog loosen up and start to socialize a little bit more. And for some dogs that have big insecurity issues around other dogs and stuff like that, this could be a quick process and you never need to correct the dog and you need to just give them that opportunity to supervise and watch and make sure nothing bad happens. Um, for some dogs, this can take a while. I mean, we have dogs that'll come to daycare once or twice a week for two months before they ever start playing with other dogs. It's totally fine. You can't rush the process. The goal is always to move them in the right direction. So can we start at least getting them around other dogs? Can we at least start building their confidence around other dogs and have them experience, okay, I'm around this other dog and I might not like it. I might be a little bit nervous, but I'm not doing anything. Right? And that's gonna start turning into them loosening up and then starting to play and stuff. So uh, like I said, loaded question. I usually recommend find a professional for this. Um, but if the issues aren't super serious, follow those steps and you should be able to get the job done. Now, another big thing, and this is kind of off topic, but uh, in regards to the e-collar, make sure the e-collar is set like extra tight in these situations, like extra tight, just so you know it's making contact. If you need to use it, you're not gonna be having contact issues. We see all the time, people, even some of our clients will come in and drop their dogs off for daycare and the e-collar is just like a necklace on them. And you know, if those contact points aren't making contact with the skin, it's not gonna work. And especially in situations like this where you're really gonna need it, make sure it's tight enough, make sure it's working. Let's get into the next question. Um, Krista's canines, um, I, th I think she, I think she might train dogs somewhere. She asked, uh, her dog sheds a lot. It's been a constant issue and her vacuum can't handle it anymore. How do I train him to stop shedding? Please help. I believe that Bridget's comment saying that um, shedding is an intelligence thing and that Doof may not be the most intelligent and that may be why he's shedding might be correct. So hope that helps. Hope that also helps any outside people. Next one, newish puppy had for four months joined older dog. They love walks, but the puppy can't stand if the older dog gets ahead. Puppy is fine walking by self and not pulling with other dogs, pulls awful and walks sideways to be in front of the other dog. All right, so this just sounds like you got a wild puppy that needs some training. Again, we sometimes we go into situations with new dogs that we get with the expectation that our dog should 
should just be great in all situations or know what the criteria is in all of these different situations. But unfortunately, we need to teach these things and we need to have two sides of the equation any time that we're trying to work on something, right? We have to have the ability to tell the dog yes, and we have to have the ability to tell the dog no in a way that they understand. Then, in order to use our yes and no, we have to have something that we know the dog understands. So, what I recommend doing here. First and foremost, get yourself a prong collar for the dog. Start your basic leash pressure work. Again, lots of videos on our YouTube channel of how to do this. Get the dog understanding the heel position just by itself. And I'm talking really good. I know you said the dog is good by itself, but like not with the older dog, but like I want a rock solid heel where you can hold the very end of that leash and the dog understands how to stay there, not just because you're micromanaging the dog into the position. From there, you're gonna start your e-collar training. You're gonna train your healing just like we recommend training your healing. It's a three-step process. You got your prong collar introduction, you got step one of your e-collar healing, and you got step two of your e-collar healing. Again, detailed videos on how to do this are on the YouTube channel. Just train the dog to walk. Train the dog to be perfect around outside distractions. Then from there, adding your second dog into the equation is simple because the second dog is just a distraction, right? So you would enforce your healing exactly how you would enforce it if you were just walking past another dog or if you were walking past something that smelled good on the ground or whatever it may be. And you would utilize your communication you've then established by teaching that command and having your yes and no established to be able to prove it, right? You can reward if you want when the dog's in the position. You can use your e-collar to correct if your dog's getting out of the position. And then at that point, if you're still having issues, you have either a clarity issue or you have a motivation issue, right? So either you're not being clear enough with the dog of what your criteria is, which means you're either not correcting consistently enough when the dog breaks the position or um, you're... Um, haven't done a good enough job teaching it and shaping it with the e-collar in those positions. From there, if you know that you've confirmed the clarity on it, you're correcting consistently, you're holding the dog accountable for it, you have a motivation issue, right? So whatever you are doing in that case to get the dog to walk well with you, to enforce it is not motivating enough to the dog. So if you're just using a prong collar pop and you haven't done the e-collar training, dog might not care enough about that. You may need to switch to the e-collar and get that proof, which again is what we recommend anyways, uh, in order to get the dog into that position. So basic question, you just gotta train the dog Dog, right? 90% of these issues we have are preemptive training related issues, right? We get dogs, we expect them to be just pretty, pretty darn good in general, right? And if we're, they're not showing major signs of like aggression or serious behavioral issues, we don't worry about spending the time getting like rock solid training, right? Instead of just preemptively doing it and just getting that training established so you could proof these things ahead of time and all of these little things that will turn into bigger issues later on, you could address and make sure you just have a nice well-mannered dog to start with. So let's get into the next question. So this is from Kate. Kate owns a puppy Rottweiler that was supposed to start lessons with us a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately due to the coronavirus, we have not been able to uh, start those lessons yet. So she's got a bunch of questions. I know this dog has been giving you a hard time, Kate. I'm sorry, we are gonna get this dog in soon and we're gonna get over these problems. So let's go down the list and see if we can give you some things to work on in the meantime. While on a walk, Bailey does really well up to the final turn towards home. Does not matter if I go different ways. I live on main streets, lots of traffic and semis. She will start to lunge at the vehicles. How do I stop that? Uh, Bailey will get things into her mouth, socks, guitar picks, musicians in the house, very nice. Uh, paper, dish towels. Yes, those things should be picked up, but let's be real, I have teenagers, or things get dropped by accident. Anyway, she will not drop it or leave it for anything. We've tried treats, e-collar, putting her in the crate. We've worked on this from day one and it has gotten worse. Her grip is tighter as a puppy. We could pry her mouth open, but not anymore, help. Okay, couple things. First off, says you've tried the e-collar before. Now, we train virtually 100% of the dogs that come into this facility with an e-collar, and I have not found one dog, eh, that's a lot, maybe, maybe one or two, right? But um, I very rarely found a dog that the e-collar is not motivating enough when used in these situations to stop some of these things that you need to stop. So it's kind of a two-folded question because the two big issues that you've had are it sounds like the walk, right? So the lunging on the walk towards the semis, the trucks, the buses, things like that. And then the picking things up in the house. And I know before there was some biting going on like towards you, right? <clears throat> so what you need to do here, first and foremost with the walk, the walk is gonna be a tricky one to address on your own until we start the lessons. But again, 
if you have the tools for it, it will be um, it, it it'll be easy enough to work through, right? So if you have an e collar and you have a prong collar, go through the steps just like I explained to the last dog of working through these issues, right? Teaching your healing, right? I know again, you said the dog is doing pretty good with you outside of when you turn to go back to the house, but we rarely ever see that switch where it goes from like perfect to absolutely terrible. So there's probably some things you could work on, and there's probably some ways you could. Uh, start implementing some better communication on the walk. If you have an e-collar, again, the two-step YouTube video that we have on teaching this healing is gonna get you there. Guys, I have made probably a dozen or more really in-depth, like 10 to 15 minute long YouTube videos on how to teach healing with an e-collar. The last three that I made with Forest and Major, which are important trains we have in right now, I did not edit anything out of them, right? They are straight from the beginning, from when we started and how we went about teaching these things. I show you guys everything in it. It's really simple to do at home. I promise you guys, just get your e-collar out and go through those steps of beginning to work through those things. And I promise you're gonna start to see that walk get better. So do that with your dog first and foremost to address the walking issues. We will tighten that stuff up later in the lessons, but there's no reason why. If you have an e-collar, you can't get a really good head start on things for now, right? The other one is gonna be actually the easier side of things, right? So what you need to do is you need to get your e-collar that you already have, if you still have it, you need to make sure that the dog is wearing the e-collar pretty much 100% of the time in the house right now. Anytime that you are out with this dog, e-collar needs to be on. And like I said, in the last one or the one before, make sure it's on tight enough, make sure it's making contact, make sure it is high enough, right? What you're gonna do is you're gonna have the e-collar on. You're gonna put a little lanyard on that remote so it's around your neck all the time. Anytime you're with that dog, anytime it picks something up off of the ground that you do not, what you're gonna do is you're gonna say no, you're gonna grab your e-collar, you're gonna tap the button. If the dog doesn't immediately spit it out, you're gonna turn your e-collar up. You're gonna say no, you're gonna tap the button. If the dog doesn't spit it out, you're gonna turn your e-collar up some more. You're gonna say no, you're gonna tap the button. You may wind up all the way up on the e-collar. You may wind up three quarters of the way up on the e-collar, but you are gonna find a level that the dog cares enough about and you're gonna consistently correct until that dog spits it out. If you spend five days, five days, that's it, making sure that every single time the dog does this, you correct for it and you find that level that's motivating enough and you start just keeping the e-collar set at that level that's motivating enough so you don't have to go and adjust it up every single time. I promise you, you will find almost 100% of the dog picking things up completely goes away. It's, it's really that easy, right? Um, you just have to get consistent about doing it. I promise this stuff is not rocket science, guys. We have dogs that come in here that jumping, picking things up, chewing things, stuff like that, we completely eliminate it over the course of like four days, right? Because we're consistent about it and we're motivating enough about it. Again, clarity and motivation. The two keys in addition to communication that can stop pretty much anything. And that's what our board and trains focus on, guys. That's what our one-on-one -on -one lessons focus on here is we focus on establishing that communication with dogs so that you can use it for anything. People will call sometimes and be like, I'm having this issue, this issue, this issue, this issue, this issue, right? And they'll start listing off 9,000 different things that the dog is doing. And I, I kind of stop them and I'm like, yeah, we're gonna cover all of that because again, we're not looking for symptoms here, right? I'm not looking for, I don't have to with each board and train that comes in, work on aggression towards cars, then work on aggression towards people, then work on reactivity towards dogs, then work on reactivity towards buses. And each individual thing, I just create the communication so anything that gets presented my way I could tell the dog if I like what they're doing or if I don't like what they're doing. And that's the magic behind balance training, guys. If you have both of those things established, you're gonna see all those behavioral issues just go away because you can address them in real time as they come up. That's how we get to long-term success. That's why to this day, right, if I'm out with my dogs or you know, six years post-training, if I start having an issue, I've established my communication. I could stop it right then and there and it never becomes a reoccurring problem. So keep those things in mind. Don't get frustrated. We're gonna get started here soon, uh, but start working on those things in the meantime. Again, I'm going off of what you said is trying the e-collar. Assuming you already have that, great. Um, if you do not have an e-collar already, um, since you're already signed up for a training program, get in touch with me, give me a call. Um, I could let you come pick one up because uh, there is one that's included in your training program. So um, give me a call and I can let you come swing by and, and pick that up from us if you need it. So. Moving on to the next question here. Any tips on how to correct an overprotective dog? My dog is so overprotective of me. When anyone walks towards me or in my direction, 
he freaks out. Okay, two things here. One, hold on, let me set my coffee real quick. Okay. So one, nine times out of 10 in these situations, the dog is not really overprotective of the owner. And some people like this and some people don't like this. A lot of people like to think that their dog is just gung-ho trying to guard them or guard their house or this or that. In actuality, nine times out of 10, when your dog is rehearsing these types of behaviors, they are scared, right? They are trying to protect themselves and that is the only thing that's going on in their head. Now, we need to look at the reasons why the dog feels the need to do them more intensely by us or more intensely in the house, right? So this typically comes down to, um, this typically comes down to us being only viewed as a resource or a last line of defense to dogs, right? So dogs always only have two options. They have the option for fight or they have the option for flight, right? Most dogs, when they're nervous or fearful or in that state of mind, flight is their number one thing. You ever try to catch a dog that's loose out on the streets that was scared, it is virtually impossible, right? Um, but those are the same dogs that you stick them in a kennel or you put them in a crate or you have them on a leash and they are going to look like the meanest, toughest dog in the world. And that's because they've eliminated flight. Flight is no longer an option to those dogs. But in the wild, they would typically just run away from things that they're scared of, right? So why do they see you as a last line of defense and a wall that they're backed against? It is because of all of the love and affection that we give them, right? It is the way that we make our dogs feel in the presence of us. And it is the games we play with them and the treats we give them. And it's the imbalance of structure, rules, and discipline that dogs have, right? So how do we start to reverse some of this stuff? We have to start taking the needle. And if this is fun and love, affection, and this is strict, discipline, militant, we need to start taking that needle from here and starting to bring it and balance it out somewhere where it's centered. Now, what do I do initially when I see stuff like this? I tend to push the needle a little further in this direction and then let it settle back to there because I want my dog to re-earn some of that love and affection around me and around my house and things like that. So start with your basic training. Well, actually start, before you start with any sort of training, before you start with the do, start with the why, right? So why is your dog doing it? Because of the love, the affection, the treats, the toys. Be very aware that positive reinforcement in the affection that we give and the petting that we do and the treats that we give not only reinforces physical things that the dog is doing, but it also reinforces emotional states of mind. Implement a policy when you are out and about. If you leave your house, the only thing that you are gonna communicate to your dog is if they're doing something that you don't want them to do. This is a big one, guys, right? If our dog only has the association of when I say something to them or do something to them or try to communicate with them in general, that it creates more arousal, that is gonna do me absolutely no good when I'm around people, right? When you're trying to console your dog when they're freaking out at somebody, you're only telling them, good job, good job, even though it's, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. They sound exactly the same to the dog. So you gotta stop doing all of those things first. I promise you, if you spend a week stopping doing that, if you spend a week going out on your walks and just, keeping your mouth shut, not saying anything, not doing anything, you're probably gonna see a reduction in the behavior in itself, right? Now, start tacking on the ability to communicate with the dog effectively. Start tacking on the ability to walk your dog in a structured heel position without them pulling on the leash. Start tacking on the ability to provide consequences for your dog picking everything up off of the ground or sniffing everything out on the walk and acting impulsively and doing what they wanna do. What's this, what's that, who's this, who's that? Is this person okay, is that person okay? you're gonna see a massive shift in the dog's state of mind, right? Step one, step two of the walk with the e-collar. Start that right away. From there, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your dog out and about and you're gonna start communicating what you want them to do, what you don't want them to do. Once you've seen a reduction in these behaviors, you can start softening up with your dog. You can start doing more things with your dog and getting them to a place um, where they're gonna start getting better on the walk. You need something? No, yes, but when you're done. Well, I mean, we're done. All right, we're gonna take a quick break here. Sorry for the quick intermission, guys. 
have to handle some staff related questions. So back to your questions now. I think I was finishing up answering the questions on the overprotective dog. Um, like we talked a little bit about the love and affection side of things, pushing the needle a little bit more towards structure, discipline, rules. Um, we talked about training the walk, starting to implement your uh, corrections and stuff on the walk um, for some of these unwanted behaviors in the house. Um, usually what I'll do if I'm having protective dogs is I'll start setting boundaries. I say like where there are no boundaries. So no furniture access uh, for a little bit, make the dog earn those things back once they stop rehearsing these things. Um, and stop encouraging your dog to be in your space so much, right? Like I said, our dogs view us as the wall because we tend to encourage it. Every time they come near us, we're petting them, we're giving affection, we're, we're doing things to keep them there. So start just ignoring them. If they come over to you, shoo them away or go walk somewhere else or do things like that, right? Um, provide your corrections for getting onto the furniture. Just, just you got to look at these things as you know, as if we were getting dogs in for, like we're getting dogs in for board and trains, right? These dogs do so well on the board and trains when they come here and they don't rehearse these behaviors because right off the rip, things are different, right? We create dramatic shifts in what the dog is used to doing in their day to day. They're in a crate at night and, you know, during the day in between their training sessions and stuff, which most of these dogs are not used to. For the first like week or so that they're here, honestly, we're not really petting them and playing with them and doing things with them outside of just training them right? And the dogs don't care, right? That's the biggest thing to realize also is they have fun doing those things. That's what they really need is that mental stimulation and that mental engagement. We're not giving all these mixed messages through the treats and the, the toys and the praise and stuff like that. And we're treating them a little bit more like dogs and a little bit less like our best friends in these situations. And because of that, they thrive. They do so well. They quickly learn what the expectation is of them. Uh, and they quickly fall into that expectation. So you gotta just start adding more structure rules and discipline in and focusing on making sure the discipline you are providing for the things you don't want is motivating to the dog. Figure out what this dog really does not like and you need to start consistently providing that every time the dog is acting up or doing these things on top of removing the things that you're already doing that are further creating the issue. So hope that helps. Uh, loaded question. Again, overprotective dogs, you know, human guarding, whatever you want to call it, things like that. There's so many variables that go into it, which is why we do one-on-one -on -one sessions or board and train so we can get into kind of the nitty gritty of all of those variables and help people make those adjustments with the dogs. Um, all right, moving on to the next one. How to build drive, toy drive, engagement, and focus in a low drive dog. Um, as far as building toy drive with the dog, I'll be honest, I don't really get into that a whole lot. I used to do sport dog training and I used to focus on building you know, motivation and stuff for toys and stuff to teach um, and stuff like that. But anymore, I don't care. I mean, my girlfriend's dog is the least toy driven dog you will ever meet in your life and has never one time inhibited her ability to learn things. It has never one time created any sort of problem. If anything, it has made her lives easier because she's not always hyped up about like, oh, there's this bone or there's this toy or you gotta throw the ball and she's going flying for it and, and this and that, right? I find that toys in general can create some really um, unwanted behaviors in dogs with some dogs. They can't control it, right? Whether it is chasing a ball, you know, kind of correlating to chasing squirrels if you're having issues with that or tug correlating to challenging your guests and stuff like that or challenging you. Um, if your dog doesn't have huge toy drive, I wouldn't be really focused on building that drive. Now, if you're looking for that drive for the purpose of training things, then I would rely a little bit more heavily on food drive. We just made a really detailed video on how to build food drive. Um, you'll see that video uh, just from like last week if you go back in our videos we get into the nuances of how to adjust your dog's feeding schedule if their feeding is, or if their food drive is not very good. Uh, we talk about how to use that food, either dog's daily kibble and stuff like that for your training purposes and stuff, and getting them off of uh, this kind of free feeding schedule of you know eating some of their food and then leaving some of it, then overeating at night and being inconsistent. And basically what it comes down to is rationing out your portions where um, the dog is not overeating, right? So you're not feeding them seven gazillion cups of food a day, you're feeding them an appropriate amount of food. Now that is not the amount of food that it says on the bag because dog food bags uh, and dog food companies want to sell you more food. So they're going to say more than what your dog um, should be eating. And also, I mean, they're not factoring in the breed of the dog, the age of the dog. They're not factoring in the activity level of the dog. Like it's, that is such a bullshit gauge off of food drive for dogs or, or food intake for dogs. So 
Go off of how much the dog is eating. Start with, you know, if you got a, a larger dog, start with a cup in the morning, cup in the evening, flat, measured out. Don't use your red Solo cup. Don't use your Cedar Point mug that you want to fill up and use. Don't use a plastic container or anything like that. Measure it out, right? No differently than with the person if they're trying to lose weight or something, you know? You got to measure out that food. From there, spend a week, once in the morning, once in the evening, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, anything that they do not eat goes back in the bag. They do not get it in the evening time. That food does not roll over because that's gonna cause them to overeat if you start doing where it rolls over. If after a week the dog is still leaving food in the bowl, cut it back a little bit more. Go three quarter, three quarter and see what you get, right? Um, if the dog is then starting to lose too much weight, re-up it a little bit and just kind of, you know, gauge it based on that. Uh, and you'll find something consistent. You'll build your dog's food drive and you'll be able to utilize that food drive in your training and be able to gain their motivation uh, and get their obedience looking really good. So. Hope that helps with that question. Uh, Brandon Schaefer, how is Leo doing? Leo is doing fantastic. Leo is a dog we've utilized now two times for um, DIY dog training videos. We did one on the recall and training recall with him. Uh, and we also did one on teaching the downstate that just got posted yesterday with him. So he's doing wonderful. We're happy to have him here. We're happy to get him home. Next question. Jackie, a Border Collie mix, is very dominant and reactive. She seems easily frightened by people and will snap at them. I've done a lot of work to set boundaries with her and I've given all of my guests the tools they need to assist set boundaries with her when they come over, but she's fluffy and sweet and sits on your foot and if you let her, and so most people ignore me. How can I teach her not to be reactive even when people are allowing her to set the rules or push her boundaries? So standing over her, asking her to jump, generally getting her too excited. Okay, so the big thing um, that is standing out to me about this question is where you said you've given all your guests the tools they need to assist set boundaries with her when they come over. No matter what, it is our job to keep our dogs under control around our guests. It is our job to make sure our dogs are gonna be safe and compliant and listen and follow the rules and follow the boundaries. It is never going to be my guest's job for things like that, or my guest's uh, job, right? Um, and I train for that, right? If my dog is jumping on another person, it doesn't matter what that person is doing, that's never okay for them to do, right? My parents are the prime example. They would never listen to the rules that I would set for my dogs, right? They would always get them all excited and come over and try to give them treats and do this and do that and stuff like that. And no matter what, I needed to take matters into my own hands and I needed to make sure my dogs realized no matter what they're doing in this situation, four paws need to stay on the floor, right? No matter what they're doing in this situation, if I recall you over and I ask you to go to your bed over there, you gotta do it or there's gonna be consequences for it. So you need to stop looking at how can your guests help you in this situation and you need to start look at how can you take your training from this level where they're good and they listen to you, right? and take it from there and to, they listen to you under any distraction, no matter what, right? And some people just, I, I, I feel like don't think that's possible or don't think that's realistic, right? And they, they make excuses for their dog's poor behavior and blame it on the guests or they blame it on the other dog or they blame it on this or that, when in actuality, it's always gonna boil down to my fault in those situations. I haven't done a good enough job in training my dog around those types of distractions. So. I obviously don't know your dog, but I would ask myself, one, what, what degree of training have I really done with this dog? What degree of proofing have I really done with this dog's behavior? Is this dog remote collar trained? Does this dog really understand these commands, right? Uh, does this dog really understand the rules and boundaries? I know you said you've tried really hard to set rules and boundaries. So at that point, if you know that you've been consistent about trying to discipline the dog when the dog does these types of things, um, you need to ask yourself two things. One, are you only trying to discipline those things when your dog is doing it to you, or are you also doing it when it's doing it to the guests and when you're trying to get your dog to do things around the guests. And if so, you got a motivation issue. Again, clarity and motivation, right? The, whatever you are doing to try to discipline the dog for those things is not being perceived as effective by the dog, right? So you gotta figure out what is a dog not like. Again, I use remote collars for this. I found that they're the easiest. I found that they're the most reliable. I use them with my dogs in these situations. Uh, some people will use a pet corrector for stuff like this. Some people use a bonker. Some people use a leash. You can use anything as long as the dog cares about it, right? You have to know that whatever you're doing to try to stop that jumping and try to stop that, you know, that, that behavior that your dog is doing, they care about, right? Now, 
don't look at the symptoms of, you had mentioned like the snapping and some of the aggression and the, the nervousness around the people and stuff like that, and look at the reason why the dog is doing those things is because of the lack of control in those situations. So I would challenge you to take your training to that next level. Make sure that you are not looking that, at this as, you know, your guest's job to do it, or your dog is just doing it because they're nervous or fearful of this or that, and look at it as the dog is doing this because they're not under control in this situation, so they're having spikes and arousal, right? And those spikes and arousal can get your dog into trouble no matter what. I don't care if they're excited or nervous. If they're constantly peaking from really jacked up because people are here to then really nervous that uh, people are trying to pet them in a way that they don't like, to really excited to go out on the walk, to really, really reactive because a dog's coming by, right? They're constantly ping-ponging like this, right? As opposed to them staying in this middle ground of, I'm focused on my handler right now. Okay, there's a dog there. I'm gonna get a little bit excited, but I'm gonna stay focused on the handler, right? And then uh, I'm a little nervous of this truck that's coming by, so I'm gonna come down here, but I'm still focused on my handler, right? You start to see things go from this to a little bit more gradual, right? And what happens is once they hit that gradual period where they're focused and they're just kind of, you know, they're aware of the things, but gotta pay attention to dad here, gotta pay attention to mom here, you start to see those behaviors go away. So, training, the answer is training. Guys, the answer to all of these questions is training, right? Most people do not have the degree of training over their dog that they need. So I'm challenging all of you guys, especially during these quarantine times, improve on your dog's training, start to move those things further in the right direction and make sure that you're uh, getting the dog, the communication and the control that you need around these things, right? Okay, next question. I guess I'm a little confused at the fact my rescue was in a room with two other dogs and was fine when I picked him up. I tried to have him meet another dog we know in an area they both didn't know. Uh, and on the leash and he kept pulling, lunging and acting aggressively. I'm unsure if it's the leash because he hates being walked on the leash as well or if he does not like other animals. Um, okay, Kayla, so yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this a little bit before uh, as far as the other person that was asking, asking about aggression issues and stuff. Um, most dogs will find um, that come in that have dog aggression issues, right? People that contact me, uh, most of them have never actually been in a real social situation before, right? Most of them have never been able to off-leash interact with another dog. They've only been in situations either behind fences or behind leashes um, or behind something that's gonna create a degree of frustration, right? I just uh, put up a video the other day on why on-leash greetings are one of the worst ways to socialize your dog and it boils down to the leash symbolizes restraint. Uh, another thing we talked about earlier was that dogs only have fight or flight as options, right? Um, so because they only have fight or flight, if they're on a leash, that leash you know, eliminates flight. So if they're nervous and they can't move around in the way that they want, they're gonna show those aggressive signs. They're gonna fight or they're gonna react, right? And show that arousal in a different way. And it's gonna look scary and it's gonna put us in a position where we're not able to socialize the dogs, or it's gonna put us in a position where we're gonna try to socialize the dog with these spikes of arousal and you're gonna cause a dog fight because of it, right? So um, I would bet, you know, especially if you picked your dog up with uh, a couple of other dogs, right? I would bet the dog is relatively social, but you just said it yourself. The dog hates the leash. So tack the arousal of seeing another dog with the hatred of the leash and you're gonna see a really nasty display. So what I would say is, like I said, with the socialization before with the other dog, make sure you have a way to communicate with the dog, whether it's a remote collar or a pet corrector or something to discipline the dog if it does something you don't want, get a muzzle, and go in the situation and, and just drop the leashes, right? Don't even think about it, just drop the leashes and just watch it and just see what happens. Um, follow the same steps I talked about with the other person of making sure there's no toys, um, no food and no affection going on in any of those situations uh, and make sure it's in a neutral area like you did and just see what happens, right? Um, nine times out of 10, you're gonna see the dog is gonna be fine. Right? And then once the dog proves that they're doing okay, pop that muzzle off, let the dog socialize. But I think the leash is the problem. So socialization is one side of the equation of things you need to work on and then you need to get the dog better with that leash if the dog hates the leash that's something you need to work through i don't ever take my dog doesn't like this as a reason to not do something i work them past that because that's ultimately going to build their confidence and make them more reliable with things so hope that helps probably not dog aggression probably just reactivity in that situation um have a dog that used to have horrible dog reactivity on the walk 
for the most part, been able to get over the large explosions using the e-collar, um, but still have an issue with fixating on a dog as we pass. Not sure if we should give corrections for the fixating, and if so, how loud of correction, which I'm assuming they mean what intensity, right? This is a tricky question and it's dog dependent, right? Um, I always say like, I don't mind looking as long as the dog is staying focused on the task at hand. So what I would ask is, is the dog fixating and stopping doing whatever it is that you asked them to do? Or is the dog looking but maintaining position? For example, with my Malinois, squirrels are like his ultimate kryptonite, right? He loves them, they get him super jacked up, and that's very normal for those types of breeds, right? Um, that being said, his fixation on the squirrels cannot stop him from walking nicely with me or recalling when I need him to or things like that. But you better believe today, I did a five and a half mile walk with my dogs. And when I was walking, we passed a couple squirrels and I was totally loose on the leash. He was walking in a perfect heel position with me, but he was looking at that squirrel pretty much the entire time, right? Um, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's unrealistic to have this expectation of as I'm working through these problems that my dog's never going to look at those or never going to get excited by those things as long as they're not reacting at them. Now, dogs is a little different. I want my dog to be able to ignore those because it's not like an instinctual thing like prey drive is, right? But as you're working through really intense dog reactivity, depending on how long you've been working on this for, um, they might show a little bit of looking like that. They're still concerned, you know what I mean? Like they're not reacting, but they still might be a little concerned. Like, oh, I'm scared of this dog and I'm used to reacting when this is going on and I don't really know what to do right now. So I'm gonna just look and make sure that he's you know, in the correct spot and stuff like that. And like I said, as long as they're staying with you, that's fine. Now, difference here. If you're walking and when you're passing the other dog, you're needing to really shorten up your leash and you're needing to really kind of pull the dog along with you because they're looking and they're stopping, that's a different story, right? So that I would be correcting for. I would say not the fixation, but the breaking of position is what I would look for. And I would be correcting it at the same intensity as you corrected to stop the other reactivity. So what you should do, if you don't already have a six foot leash, get a six foot leash hold just the handle of the leash. Do not hold it short, just the handle, because you need to see when the dog is getting out of position. You're never gonna see it if you're holding it short, because you're gonna accidentally micromanage the dog with the leash in that case. So hold the very end as you're passing the other dog, and the second that dog comes to a complete stop or veers away from you while looking at the other dog, that is where you're gonna give the correction. And that will finish off your walking and get it looking much better. If at that point you're walking and the dog's sticking with you nicely and just looking over at the other dog, I don't really care about that so much, but you are gonna be correcting for that breaking of position. So hope that helps. Uh, reactivity's tough, man, um, for some of our clients because it's so nuanced. There's so many little things that you're looking for and it is big time relationship issues. The dog needs to believe that you are not going to take that from them, right? So focus on that. If you have any questions on it, let me know. All right, last question. Uh, this is from Cliff's mom. Cliff's a superstar at her daycare. He comes all the time. She wants to know, keeping training up while in quarantine, what to do beyond down, sit stays, follow me, recalls, and daily walks. We're working on some party tricks, but I'd like to make sure we're staying sharp and productive. Training, I mean, really, so a lot of people go into things like this and they're nervous because they think their dogs need all this physical exercise, when in actuality, your dog just needs their brain worked, right? And usually early on in the training stages, like say somebody starts new one-on-one -on -one lessons, right? They are, the dogs are usually gassed for the next like 24 hours after the first couple of sessions because it's new, right? They're working and needing to really problem solve and figure out what it is that we want. But we fall into this trap post-training where once the dog already knows the stuff and just goes through the motions, it's a little bit more mindless for them. So it becomes less difficult for them they're performing and they're doing things well, but they're not really getting their brain stimulated as well as we'd like them to. So we need to look for ways to make it more challenging, right? That could be if you're working duration, for example, right? Uh, sit stays, down stays, bed stays. Um, making your duration harder, right? Can your dog hold that position while food's on the ground? Can that your dog hold that position while you're out of sight? Can that dog hold that position for an hour, right? Um, you need to start making those things more challenging. And the second you start to see holes and where it starts getting challenging, you work on it in that way, right? You work on that degree of intensity with the dog. Um, and we have some videos on how we proof this stuff and proofing the downstays and stuff, but start working things like that. Uh, with recalls, are you working recalls in new environments? Are you doing leash walking in new environments? Are you, um, 
proofing things like your dog holding rock solid sits while people that are really exciting to them are petting them and stuff like that, right? And on our walk today, we took our dogs up to uh, uh, visit some friends that were working and they had to hold it down say the whole time they were petting them just as a training exercise, right? They're fine with people, they don't have any issues, but we challenged them to, you gotta hold this right now because we know it's gonna be difficult for you and we know it's gonna stimulate your brain, right? So look at the things you're already working on. It sounds like you're killing it already and just make them harder, right? Make them harder for the dog and push them past that point and get them looking really good with that stuff. So, all right guys, this was a long one, couple little breaks in it, but I think we did a pretty good job of burning through those 16 questions. Actually, I think it was more like 14. There's a couple of replies to questions in here. Um, but yeah, just a fun little Q and A for you guys. Had a couple little admission, intermissions there, but um, we hope everybody's doing good. Uh, we know everybody's kind of going crazy. I, we just found out like about an hour ago that uh, this stay at home ban is kind of getting moved to May 1st now, which is almost, I mean, it's a month from now. I mean, that, that is a long time, a long time for people to be stuck at home with their dogs. We were fortunate enough to be able to maintain some degree of work. We obviously don't have foot traffic coming in and out, but we're able to do our board and trains and stuff and you know keep ourselves busy and occupied, obviously, but we hope everybody's staying safe at home. We know it's crazy out there. We know everybody wants things to just start to get back to normal, but. Um, hopefully we'll be back there soon enough. If in the meantime, anybody has absolutely any questions about anything, please reach out. I mean, we're trying to help as much as we can. We're offering a 50% sale until the sixth right now on training packages. Um, and we're just trying to, we're just trying to help people out because we know you're stuck at home with your dogs. And if they're crazy, especially that could not be a good time. So now is the time, take advantage of the extra time you have to focus on the training. If you could walk your dog every day because you're home, there's no reason why you can't get rid of these reactive behaviors. And you know, you have plenty of opportunities to work on reactivity now that there's people out walking their dogs all the time. So you can train for this stuff better. Um, and you know, like I said, we just hope everybody's making the best use of that time. Um, we sure are up here and uh, we will continue to do things like this and keep you guys posted on updates and kind of go from there. So Dave with Miracle Canine Training, dog training Q&A, episode number, whatever the fuck, I don't know. So we'll catch you guys in the next one.